Good afternoon. So, as you all know, yesterday I chaired the Emergencies Council. I made clear of that meeting. I repeat now that my overarching priority is the health of all islanders, especially the most vulnerable, and that we take steps appropriate for Jersey, backed by expert medical advice. I also want to clarify our travel advice and its restrictions. We've been advised by the Deputy Medical Officer for Health, Dr. Ivan Muscat, that the island does not need to be locked down at present, and we need to enable islanders to retain normal life activities. If islanders want to travel, they should only do so under FCO guidance, as is currently the case in the UK. Now, looking to the immediate situation, I believe we're in a good position because of the planning that has been taking place to date. And yesterday, we made further decisions that will reduce the spread of coronavirus in Jersey, and those were discussed this morning in the Council of Ministers. I've asked competent authorities and relevant ministers to make arrangements from these decisions, and they will provide detailed advice to islanders in due course. Our approach is health-led, and we'll be allocating new and extra funding when the medical advice is it will work to reduce the spread of the virus. Our focus, under the most up-to-date advice from Dr Muscat, is to do everything possible to protect Jersey's most vulnerable. And we have agreed that for all government employees, as we elaborated yesterday, all non-essential business travel will be suspended for the foreseeable future. This includes teachers, and so school trips will be cancelled in the immediate future. Now, it's likely we will need to make further decisions about school and colleges remaining open. And at present, schools and colleges will remain open, but it is likely that we will need to review these arrangements over the next short period. And any decision will be based on the necessary health advice. We are not at the same stage as the UK or Ireland, and so our response to closures will be different at this time. Large-scale events and public gatherings are under review and may need to be postponed. This will depend on the nature of the event and its participants. Now, I understand this may be disappointing for some, but I'm firm in my commitment to protect the most vulnerable based on medical advice. You will hear from the Minister for Health and Community Services on our programme for GP and primary care to offer bespoke advice to the over 80s and those with chronic illnesses. And this will impact over 17,000 islanders and begins today. The Minister for Economic Development, with the support of the Social Security Minister and the Treasury Minister, has announced a series of measures to mitigate the impact of coronavirus on the island economy. These include deferring the payment of Social Security contributions, the deferral of GST payments, and payment deferrals where the government is a landlord to local business. I'm leading the cross-government approach to this virus with making sure that islanders are supported by all departments and have the correct information backed by sound medical advice in order to carry on their daily lives with as little undue interruption as possible. We've had council ministers this morning, we've updated state members just now, and I will be chairing the emergencies council again next week, and we will be updating members and then the media as appropriate on the outcome of that meeting. That concludes my words on this matter. Good afternoon. The government has approved extra funding for a bespoke service that seeks to protect the most vulnerable in our community. By targeting these islanders with tailored advice and treatment, we're working to slow the spread of coronavirus, effectively flattening the curve of cases and containing the virus. So from today, as the Chief Minister has said, GPs will be contacting islanders over the age of 80 and those with chronic diseases, and that accounts for 17,000 islanders. There will be no charge made to those islanders. GPs will be calling them to individually review their support network, their medication, their overall health, their access to food supplies, and their understanding of hand and respiratory hygiene. Those islanders with a chronic disease, that is COPD, asthma, chronic heart disease, and diabetes, will also be assessed on their current symptoms and their medication. GPs will then be providing patient-specific advice on how their patients can amend their daily routines, 
to keep them safer from contracting the virus. The GPs will then maintain regular contact with them to monitor their health and their needs, making advice and amending their routine based on the best medical advice at the time. Some patients may be advised to limit their contact with relatives who have cold or flu symptoms, and some may need to cancel their participation in community events. But it is not a curfew for them. They may still need and be able to visit the shops and spend time outside their homes. It may be an inconvenience for some islanders, but our approach is health-focused, and all the advice at all times will be based on the most up-to-date medical information. Thank you. Okay, I think we'll just now hand over to yourselves to um, see what questions you want to put to us. I think the, sort of, the question that everyone's sort of been asking on social media, because they sort of compare Jersey to, to the UK and the response that came out just before Jersey response came out yesterday, and sort of what's been going on in Guernsey, is why is Jersey different? Why are we taking this, particularly sort of Guernsey, of advising some of all non essential travel? I think we're still sort of saying, despite some sort of tweets and things like that, that you know, we're still going on holidays, as we said yesterday. So we're different on that front to Guernsey. And likewise, the UK. I sort of really push that message about if you've got any sort of symptoms, even if you've not been in contact with anyone, you may have had the virus, you've been away, self-isolate for seven days. Jersey's message seems to be a bit different, which is what we sort of see why they're different. I'll give you a, the brief over your response, and I'll hand over to Caroline to yeah. give you the, the health perspective mm -hmm. and reiterate we are always doing this on the health advice that we receive. Yeah. Yes. Also emphasise on the point that um, uh, this is a rapidly changing scenario. And also, each jurisdiction has slightly different um, uh, profiles, if you like, and also might be at different stages as this matter progresses. Yeah. And that's why you might get slightly different responses at different points in time. Mm -hmm. But um, from the medical side and the health side, I'll uh, let Caroline get to it. So we are trying to flatten the wave. Yeah. You, you can't stop an ep epidemic, but you can stretch it out. So we don't have that short, sharp peak of multiple cases all appearing simultaneously and health services become overwhelmed. What we are trying to do is stretch out that wave so the same number of patients are affected, but fewer die as a result of health services becoming overwhelmed. Yeah. Well, Can we ask about Jersey Hospital in terms of its preparations for a massive epidemic? I mean. How are we in terms of enough beds and things like that? Yes, there are excellent preparations around providing for these. We have the right number of beds if that wave is flattened uh, as we intend. Uh, it will be stressful within the hospital. It will look different. We will need to cancel non -root, uh, sorry, routine stuff that we do in the hospital in order to devote resources to the emergencies. But if we can flatten that wave, as the plans are, the hospital will be able to look after islanders. Um, we must realise it is an epidemic. It's quite feasible that there will be fatalities, most regrettably. But that is because it is an epidemic. But we must prevent uh, that degree of harm occurring if we allow the spike to develop. We've been standing up for this within Health and Community Services since the first cases were um, announced in Wuhan. We are reviewing our business continuity plans on a daily basis. We have stood up our silver and gold command. We have our epidemic room live within the organisation. I'm confident that if we respond to this as a society, that we will have the facilities in place in order to be able to care for islanders. I'd just like to... Um So we are able to ventilate 29 patients and um, so that, that is our ITU capacity and we have a hub which is on the ground floor of our hospital which is most of the ground floor at the moment um, and that is our hub for managing our response to the challenge of the virus. And so is the hospital keeping beds free at the moment specifically with a view to keeping them available for coronavirus patients? So we have empty beds anyway within the system. Um, we 
but what we are doing is we are planning for a different utilisation of that capacity so that we can be much more flexible and able to respond to the demand that comes through our front door. We've now heard a lot on social media from uh, people with a range of qualifications, some of them experts and some not. How, how much of a problem is, uh, is that and some of the, the noise that's, uh, that's coming from that door? Well, I've got, I'll answer that uh, go to that first. Um, we are aware that there is, certainly if you look on the, the Facebook and some of the Twitter side, that um, there are some false rumours being spread and all that type of thing. So overall, over the last, I'll say, few days, beginning of last week, um, the overall comms message has been ratcheted up. That's, for example, why there was a leaflet drop to all islanders, which certainly I received today, I think, uh, today and yesterday, and maybe uh, there's only left for tomorrow. Um, but the next step is that within the communications team, uh, there will be um, people trying to respond to some of the other concerns of islanders that will be happening from kind of today and then going over the weekend and into the beginning of next week. Um, so dealing with some of the concerns of islanders that are being expressed on social media and also dispelling some of the myths. And I think that's quite important because as you say, um, we have a range of opinions being expressed and um, some might be somewhat less valid than others. I do agree. I think we must avoid causing anxiety within the population. We can understand uh, a degree of concern. Um, we're all concerned, but there is no need. And it can be increased risk if we uh, gen engender a feeling of great anxiety uh, and ill preparedness. The island is well prepared. Um, and staff are ready to, to address issues. I think it's also worth just making the point. So firstly, again, we recognize Islanders' concerns about what will be coming down the line from what they're reading in the national press and what they're starting to hear in the local press. As Richard has said, as Caroline has said, we are very well prepared for this um, and we are, you know, and we're gearing up that effort even more. Just because the Emergencies Council met on this um, yesterday, um, it wasn't the first time we were talking about it. This has been prepared for quite some time. Um, the uh, sorry, um, the other measure I think we do need to just make a point of is we are about spend three to four, four to week, four to six weeks um, behind the UK in terms of experience and impact on the island. And that means there's two things. One is we can learn from the UK and prepare, but it also means we are at a different point, and that's why um, uh, reactions, communications will be different because we are at a different point in time in this situation versus other jurisdictions. How, how many weeks could I just clarify? Oh, Caroline. It's three to four weeks. Does that mean sort of what we're seeing in the UK now in terms of the measures there, we, we might see feasibly three to four weeks down the line? So we're, we're, we're acting on ongoing advice from our medical officer for health. Mm. Well, you mentioned that off-island school trips are now um, are being cancelled. Yes. Um, why is that decision being made now, and why not before? Because we've had lots of people get in contact with us regarding JCD students that went to Italy, and that's self-isolate. Why was that decision not made so they didn't go to stay on the side of caution? Um. I was going to say, I think the, the, the shorter answer is, and then I'll hand over to the health side, is again all dependent on the advice, um, the medical advice one receives at that point in time. Uh, and it has changed rapidly. So, for example, the advice when that particular group came back was that they didn't need to self isolate, and that changed within 24 hours, which gives you an indication of how quickly some of this has moved. Um, but that is why, so now the advice is, which is what we've acted on, and that is actually one of the reasons we've defined it in the way we're doing that. We've talked about government employees, which then has the knock-on effect on school trips. Are you concerned about the number of nursing staff in terms of at the hospital, you know, on hand to deal with a crisis, the crisis? It's obviously something that we have considered and planned for because it is possible that uh, staff will fall ill themselves or be in a household where one member is self-isolating and they will be required to, or they may have childcare responsibilities also. So there is good planning around how we use our staff 
uh, to best effect. There are certain functions within health services that, that will need to cease because they're non-urgent uh, and staff will be asked to do different things. Even civil servants may be asked to come into hospital services in some way to, to do work which uh, uh, and thereby release health staff to do uh, address coronavirus issues. What do you mean by that then? Which sort of civil servants are we talking? And oh, what roles? We, we, we've got to ask people to be flexible and I don't think it's just within Government of Jersey. It'll be this whole island to uh, work with the medical advice, to work with best practice uh, and, and help the island fight off this uh, virus. Just jumping back to a point before, um, I asked him about compared, um, different jurisdictions and he said you know, everyone's got sort of their own sort of uh, de de demographic and their own sort of situation. How how much how much different is that to Guernsey though? Because Guernsey, like I said, seems to be taking a very different approach. Is it a case that we disagree with what Guernsey are doing? Because it seems to be, you know, roughly the same number of diagnoses, similar sort of populations, quite high, and you'd imagine that our response would, would mirror each other, but they seem to be taking a different approach. Guernsey are acting on the on the advice of their medical officer for health. Yeah. And we fully support the actions they are taking to protect their islanders. We are acting on the advice of our medical officer for health who equally is concerned with protecting the health of islanders. In this case, we just, we just disagree. I, I don't think we disagree. I think we are at different stages and we are acting accordingly. The earlier you intervene, the longer you have to maintain that intervention. We are at a stage of, of the epidemic, uh, we, are, we are at the stage of our challenge around the virus, whereby we have been having daily meetings with our medical officer for health within the hospital and receiving advice from him on how best to proceed in order to keep islanders safe. Are you talking to Guernsey um, about what each other is doing, especially with people obviously from flying between quiet people? We are, and we're talking to the UK. We are ensuring that we are maintaining um, communication so that we are aware of decisions being taken and how they may impact upon Jersey. And do you think you have a bit of clarity surrounding the figures potentially of what we're looking at, the kind of growth of this um, illness over the coming weeks and months, and potentially as they try to or rather to recirculate and mutate them? But so would you also be able to provide an update to the general public? So we are doing modelling, as you as you would imagine, in order to be able to project um, the the journey of the virus, and we are updating that on a daily basis. I would anticipate that we would want to share that within the next few weeks, but at the moment we're still finessing that data. The virus is a completely unfamiliar virus, so therefore we are having to ensure that the information that we give to the public is the right information, because it is our job to ensure that we keep islanders safe. So that would imply, because there was, there was a slide that was seen and mm. taken down that showed sort of what the reasonable worst case scenario deaths, reasonable worst mm. case scenario mm. hospital, mm. Machine, the reasonable worst case scenario ICU admission. Um, that was already said, okay, those figures were already there, that would imply just what you said, that perhaps those figures have changed and that's sort of what we're working towards. It's an agile process which is changing every day and which is why we are working closely with our medical officer of health to ensure we have the best information available so that we can provide the best information to keep islanders safe. Can I just go back to the health workers? Yes, their well-being is a concern, and we, we are speaking with them. Um, particular thinking is, is around if they have responsibilities for their children at home. Uh, if, if schools are not meeting, then how will they address those? Or if they become ill, the best means of preventing them becoming ill. Um, it, it is a concern um, and it is being addressed within the service. Caroline, anything else? We have a dedicated manager within our hub whose specific remit is to focus on ensuring that we maintain our staff's wellbeing. They are at the forefront of our line of um, defence. Returning to the topic of schools, we obviously realise that that's something under review in terms of whether they'll close or not. I think you used the phrase that we'll be looking at that over the next short period. So 
well, since that period, what length of time are we looking at until a decision is made either way and would there have to be a particular trigger point for it to be disclosed? I think the short answer on that is the emergency council will be meeting next Tuesday and at that point, um, that's the next whole point, if that makes sense. Um, so we'll review it at that point. Uh, the intention, whatever decision is made, or sorry, if a decision is made to do any closures, is to give as much advance warning to parents as possible. Um, but that will be a decision that will be made, or may or may not be made rather, but will be considered next Tuesday. And will the Education Minister be present at that meeting? I noticed she wasn't in the previous one. So. Yes, the, the reason is, so um, the Emergencies Council is governed by law as to who attends. Um, but what we'll be doing, we'll be inviting her in. To, uh, so that was the, pre the preliminary formal meeting, was she wasn't present. We did have an update meeting amongst ministers, which she did attend last night. And obviously she was at council minister this morning. Um, and we will be inviting her to attend, uh, or to be in attendance at the Emergencies Council at the next on Tuesday. Have you got any plans to close Sunday York Nursing Home? That's obviously state-owned. Uh, no plans to close it. Oh, you mean to restrict? Or like restrict visitors, or sorry if I've missed it, just wonder what, where we're up to with that. So I'm not aware of any formal announcement as yet, but I, um, Caroline, are you aware? Not currently. No. Presumably you'll go away thinking about that because some of the other nursing homes are restricting visitors now. Yes, nursing, yeah. nursing ho homes are taking independent action around restriction of visitors. Um, as I've said earlier, this is an agile situation, so our advice may change. You said, obviously, there's uh, extra support going to elderly, 80 plus, who are most at risk. We've heard from many parents who are worried about maybe younger children. Are they more at risk um, to possibly becoming uh, a catching the disease and what supports do you make available? Can we just clarify one point? It's not just over 80s. It's 18 over, but also those with chronic conditions, which yeah. is by far the, um, the biggest number, which could well be uh, teenagers if they've got something, or, or middle-aged. Yeah, um, but my focus was more on it, in relation to the, the youngsters. Unless children have comorbidities, then thus far we are not seeing that children are, are being particularly affected. And this whole sort of theory about sort of tackling the, the curve, which was spoken strongly last night by the Blanking Boris Johnson. Um, the sort of the theory of that is, if correct me if I'm wrong, is that we kind of want people to get the virus, but at a at the pace that we want them to get it. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yeah. And and so there's a sort of a lot of fear at the moment that if you catch it, you're in a, in a, in a bad situation, which you know is quite clearly wrong if you if you go into a reading. Um, is Jersey's sort of approach then that we that we do want the virus to spread? but in a, in a way that we manage. So we would prefer the virus not to spread, yeah. um, but we are encouraging immunity, mm -hmm. but we are doing it in a managed way so that we flatten the curve, so we will get the same level of infection, but it will be at a staggered pace so that we do not overwhelm health services and we are able to treat patients effectively. Do you expect there will be a time shortly where we've seen in the UK and in, in Guernsey that people with minor symptoms, colds, etc., are being told to self isolate for seven days? Is that going to be something you expect to happen here too? It's, it's, so we are speaking to the medical officer for health on a daily basis, and as we get updated information, we will share that. Yeah. Obviously, um, large scale yeah. events are always on the view as it's previously been uh, stated. What particular events are in your sights in terms of keeping an eye on your creation of this message? Um, so there will be some guidance issued, uh, as we, we agreed to some parameters um, yesterday at the Emergency Council. They'll, those will be coming out either today or, or imminently after. Um, and and you, do you need a sort of set of rules for those holding it? Some, some guidance at this stage. And as we've said, it, it does depend, for example, if it's outside and not that many people, whereas if inside and it's a thousand people can safe drive, and obviously exaggerating, there'll be um, different criteria. Or, you know, there'll be a different decision as to whether you should be continuing it or not. So we, let's get those in place first. We've also got to keep um, a very strong eye over uh, March and the events into April initially, but we're also going to keep an eye further afield. Um, at this stage, I don't want to comment specifically on individual events, 
but um, there will be some, if there are any events that are going to be affected, um, those sort of decisions will be taken either today or probably during the course of next week if they are of significance. So potentially something like Liberation Day might be discussed next week in terms of whether it will go into the... I think that's, uh, there's going to be a discussion we're going to have to have around that. That's again with the medical advice uh, perspective and also bear in mind uh, one of the criteria around um, any event is the nature of the people attending it and their exposure or their vulnerability. Has there been any discussions in the sports team in terms of Jersey Red travelling up Ireland, Jersey Bulls travelling up Ireland, a team from Britain coming over here? Um, again, this is something that's just ratcheting up uh, pretty well as we speak. So the first issue was to deal with um, the school trips, uh, of which I think some were leaving today. Um, the next one on the agenda will be, um, uh, well, essentially that will then tie into events and, and then they will go forward. Is there any particular advantage or disadvantage of tackling the spread of coronavirus on an island? Well, that's an interesting question. On that, I'm definitely going to hand <laughs> over to, um, uh, to our health expert. So I think I would have to seek the advice of the Medical Office of Health for that, <laughs> to respond appropriately to that question for you. Um, I've heard a suggestion that some cancer patients undergoing chemo will have their treatment stopped until this crisis passes, just because they're more obviously vulnerable to coronavirus and this is considered the least worst option. Is there some truth in that? No, there is no intention to stop patients accessing the care that they need. And just a, a last one, I think, from, from myself. Um, we spoke about sort of social media a little bit before. Mm -hmm. um, is it sort of fair to say you think that perhaps from within government there's been a bit of a mixed message? There was a, there was a statement put out yesterday that, you know, keep calm, carry on as normal, go on holidays if you like. And then sort of three hours, I think Senator Farmer tweeted that it was his advice that we should I mean, travel if it was non-essential. Um, there's been certain people in hospitals sort of echoing that message as well. There has been some mixed messages, and civil servants are civil servants, but a bit of a political message that is being contradicting. I think perhaps I, I clarified something this morning. That, um, it is all, always based around travel on the basis or look at the advice from um, the FCO and what the guidelines are coming through. Those guidelines are continuously being updated. You think it's sort of unhelpful though when people are contradicting messages that they're not trying to get out? Um, as I said, I think that's what we've got to just focus on is that it's got to be around um, look at the guidelines being issued by the FCO. They are being updated all the time. As I also said, the uh, scenario is evolving very rapidly. I think I think I said that earlier, which is that um, even the papers that we had at the Emergencies Council on the Wednesday night by the Thursday uh, afternoon had actually, um, uh, the scenario changed. And so we were looking at a certain set of different set of parameters that we're having to deal with. Mm -hmm. So it is evolving fast, and that advice then keeps getting updated. Are all ministers on board? Yes, yes. <laughs> Naturally, uh, dealing with coronavirus is going to be something that takes up a lot of manpower, both across the civil service, charity, private sector, everywhere yep. <laughs> from Germany. So in terms of time scale, how long would Ireland be looking at emergency measures, precautions and other such things? I mean, are we talking in this year, the next few months, years? What's, what's your modelling at the moment on that time scale? I think I'll deal with some of what we're doing and then I'll hand it to uh, uh, Caroline on the, um, on the modelling side. Um, one, so this is purely looking at um, government and states. Um, we have taken, uh, we've had started to air some discussions around whether we need to do a, um, a special meeting with the Assembly, um, whether uh, what we will be looking at is starting to shift ministerial business and putting it further down the line. So essentially, we've got uh, a certain number of weeks just to fine tune preparations. We want to use that and focus on the preparations of coronavirus rather than dealing with, I don't know, seatbelt legislation or something. Um, there will also be, I think, a discussion amongst backbenchers to the same principles about making sure that the work that we're doing now, before the wave uh, arrives, um, that we are focusing on what we need to do. Um, within all that lot, so for example, and again, that kind of features around events, uh, the Youth Assembly, for example, has been postponed. Uh, so we are starting to make some plans within normal business just to start shifting things uh, through. There will also be some business as usual, uh, business will carry on 
government will carry on, the parliament will carry on, the state assembly will carry on, but um, we'll probably just be slowing down somewhat to make sure that. So this is a completely unfamiliar virus, so I cannot answer that question for you. But what I can say to you that every decision and every recommendation that is made around the health of islands is a clinically considered recommendation from our medical officer for health, supported by our medical director and by our clinical leadership team. This is about taking care of islanders and making sure that they are safe. Are we expecting the throughout the summer, for example, that things might kind of lessen up a bit and come back during autumn time? Uh, or spring is going around, but what's the situation? What do you expect kind of over the maybe longer term? So we are hoping to flatten the wave with our interventions and to have a summer, a long, gentle summer, whereby we start to see the impact of our mitigations so that we are in a better position for the winter. You, you spoke a little bit just then about peak, um, and you said, I think, earlier that there's probably four weeks behind the UK, or I think you said maybe sort of 12 weeks maybe away from their peak. And maths wise, does that mean we're about sort of 15 weeks away from where we think our peak might be? Depending on our mitigation. So we are learning. That, so, so the benefit we have is that we are behind the UK, so we're able to witness the actions they've taken and we were able to learn from the impact of their mitigations. So our aspiration is to manage the peak and to ensure that when the peak comes, it is within a curve that we are able to service. I mean, you keep saying um, the medical officer of health, you know, you keep citing that in your answer. I mean, where are they? So he is a busy clinician. He's a full-time microbiologist. Yeah. And he is at the forefront of helping us around managing this challenge. So we are ensuring that he has protected time in order to be able to do that. But he is always available, and I think he has been on many media interviews, so he's always free to talk. And he was present. So Can you say what he's free. doing sort of now, as opposed to why he's back at the hospital. doing this here now? He's back at the hospital. He was at our Silver Command meeting this morning. He was meeting with me at 8am to talk through the events of yesterday. So he is busy doing what we need him to do, which is leading our medical first line um, response to the virus. Absolutely. And we've got to make sure, and that's, uh, that goes all the way down the line, but not only Justin, but other health professionals and other professionals within the organisation. That's what we're saying about we're, going to, we're starting to shift the, for, the work because we want them focusing on doing the job that they need to do. And we wish to maintain his resilience. As yep. you have said, we are a small island with a small workforce. Uh, we are incredibly lucky to have such an experienced microbiologist leading our response. We need to ensure that we protect his time. So the more islanders become acutely aware of all the symptoms, obviously there's people very much aware of the different things, the fluvial cough, shortness of breath, but that naturally crosses over with a lot of other illnesses. So as the, the peak starts to arrive, people will, perhaps without coronavirus might start thinking, well, I should get a test just to find out. So what's the maximum capacity of tests that are able to be undertaken in one day and what's the turnaround for those? So the turnaround for the tests is 24 to 48, 48 hours. We don't have any maximum around the capacity. However, at the moment, we are prioritising testing people who are returning from Tier 1 and Tier 2 countries who have obvious symptoms. Um, that looks like uh, that's probably t time to call it to a close. Just a quick one as well, sorry. Just, just <laughs> <laughs> There's always one. <laughs> um, on that basis, that we're sort of only testing, prioritising testing people with symptoms coming back from tier one and tier two countries. It would imply, given as well what the UK was saying yesterday, that all of the confirmed cases might not be all of the confirmed cases that come home, um, because there may be people who are just self isolating because they feel sick, they've got the virus, they will get over it naturally. Do we have a model similar to what the UK has? I think they've had circa 600, 500 confirmed cases, but they said there could be as many as five to 10,000 people with the illness. Do we have the same model? So that's, that, that is the modelling that we are doing. Yeah. So we Better. don't have an answer to that yet, yeah. but that's why the modelling is being refreshed. Can I just conclude by emphasising that the best thing that all islanders can do is to wash their hands thoroughly yeah. Uh, keep surfaces clean and follow that good advice in the leaflets that has been and is being delivered to to all homes. That is the best protection that, that we can ensure.
Okay, what can I say? Thank you very much. We are well prepared, and obviously we're now at that next level where we're dealing with increasing that level of preparedness for dealing for the next few days and weeks to come. And no doubt we'll be in front of you uh, again shortly. Thank you. Thank you.